heard a, actually, I think I heard a preacher on the radio say the word Calvary. Uh, I don't know, before, I can't remember if it was before or after I read it in the Bible. I never noticed it in the Bible. But the only thing I thought of when I heard the word Calvary is the Calvary. <laughs> and I'm reading my Bible thinking, what does a Calvary have to do with the Bible? And I just I couldn't figure it out. It took me a while yet. Uh, then I finally learned that Galgotha, the hill, uh, or the, the, the cross, uh, what is it? The, the place of the skull, that's what it means, the place of the skull. I was actually there, was standing at a place that when you look at it, it looks like a skull, skull hill. And uh, right there, probably a stone's throw away, uh, a little bit more, was the, uh, the garden tomb where very likely Jesus was raised from. If Daniel Fornes is hearing my voice, um, I'm wondering if he could possibly secure me, or procure me, not secure me, but procure me a thing of water. My wife potentially had it. Did you have a question? Three questions, four questions, five questions. I will do what I can. Bring them up. You know, pretty soon, da see, Daniel, in fact, here, give this back to my wife. That's the wrong one. Give that to my wife. She's got a different one. Um, anyway, uh, Daniel, one day, he's going to be standing up here and answering your questions. I'm going to we'll see if we can do that. He's really brilliant when it comes to some things. All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. God in heaven... Our Creator, our Lord, our Savior, our King, our Deliverer, Redeemer, we praise your holy name. Be with us this evening, Lord. Speak through me and help me, Father, to articulate the truth as it is in Jesus. I pray in his holy name. Amen. All right, so uh, these questions came in. I assume that since they're in the box, that the people who turned them in are here, so I'll try to address these. I haven't looked at them first. Sometimes I do like to look at the questions. It gives me an advantage to be able to look up some Bible verses and uh, not have to work off of a memory that, well, I have lost a lot of brain cells from the use of drugs. And uh, the Lord has been so gracious in resurrecting a lot of those brain cells, but sometimes I wonder how many of them are still out there that need yet to be resurrected. Okay, um, could someone change their mind if they took the mark in their hand and then realized they were selling their soul to make money to take care of their family? Uh, that is a great question. When it comes to the mark of the beast, when, you, when you're reading the Bible about the, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin, that's what receiving the mark of the beast is. It's, 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 it's coming to the point where you have totally and finally made your decision to follow man's ways and not God's ways. To reject it, it's... It was uh, the mark of the beast is, uh, thank you, my friend. The mark of the beast is the ultimate sh saying no to God. Thank you very much. I'll take them both. Thank you very much. If you receive the mark of the beast, it's like, get, it's like Noah in the ark. When they got on the ark, the door was shut, right? You had the people that were inside. And you had the people that were outside. When you made your decision to not get on the ark, you made your decision to be off the ark. See, sometimes people think that, well, I'm not going to choose the mark of the beast. No, you, you may not. The reality is if you don't accept the seal of God, you will get the mark of the beast. It's going to be kind of de facto, you're following man when you reject the ways of God. That's why we need to be active in pursuing the, way, the Lord's ways and being faithful to the Lord. And so, the long story short is that um, if you get the mark of the beast, even if you're doing it because, hey, I've got to save my family, I've got to, um, you know, my, my, my kids, they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to starve if I don't have some food for them, and if I don't have any food for them, I, if I can't buy or sell, I can't get them food, and, and you, people justify it, it doesn't matter. You may get the mark in your hand, but you're still going to be lost. Can you change your mind after that? Did Judas change his mind? You know, the Bible says Judas repented. Now, that word repented, metanoia, just means he changed his mind. After he betrayed Jesus, 
he said, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. But you know that repentance of Judas was not a genuine, heartfelt sorrow for sin. He, was in, he, he knew that he was in trouble eternally for doing what he did. You ever notice the difference between some people who are sorry that they uh, got caught? Is there a difference between being sorry for what you did and sorry that you got caught? Well, Jude, yeah, there is. And, you know, uh, Judas was sorry he got caught and was in trouble. And he did not want to face the consequences of that. But he genuinely, in his heart of hearts, did not sorrow for sin. The Bible says godly sorrow works repentance. Well, the issue is when it comes to the mark of the beast, you may get the mark of the beast and realize you shouldn't have done that. But it's like selling your soul already. You've already, you know, sold out to the devil. And, and, and it's not like, and let me make this clear, I don't want anybody to be fearful about this. You're not going to accidentally get the mark of the beast. You're not going to wake up one morning like, oh, I guess I got the mark of the beast today. No, people who get the mark of the beast have been actively rejecting God's law, been actively doing things their own way, been, been compromising all along, been accepting traditions of man so that, you know, they've been conditioned all along to get the mark of the beast. That's why, you know, and for people who want to start keeping the Sabbath, I say start keeping the Sabbath right now. Because if you're not going to keep the Sabbath right now when it's easy, you're not going to be keeping the Sabbath whenever there's threats against you for doing it, when there's persecution against you for doing it, right? If you're afraid to lose your job now, what are you going to do whenever it comes time to lose your life? You know, and so we've got to make sure that we're being faithful to Jesus right now. You know, there's some people who won't bother to get up out of bed in the morning to go to church on the Sabbath. Now, how are they going to be, you know, if, if, they're, if they're too lazy or too, um, I don't know, maybe it's not laziness, maybe it's just dryness. Maybe they complain about, you know, the preacher's not the best preacher, or whatever excuse they have for not going to church. Um, what are they going to do whenever it really comes down to getting hard? It is easy right now to follow Jesus. You realize that. It wasn't easy for the apostles. It wasn't easy for the first century Christians. It wasn't easy for the Christians during the dark ages. But you and I have it easy. But it's not going to stay that way. And so we've got to choose today to follow Jesus. Jesus said it to the, those women who are following after him. He says, if they have done this in a green tree, what's going to happen in a dry? Jesus said, if they've done this whenever they had relatively good opportunities... What's going to happen whenever all those opportunities are gone? We've got to choose now. So I don't, I don't believe, biblically speaking, you can, it says those who get the mark of the beast are lost. There's, you know, you, there's no changing positions after that point. Where did the theory of once saved, always saved come from? And what to say, what, what do you say if it's brought up? That's a great question. Once saved, always saved. Who's heard of that once saved, always saved teaching? Okay, um, there's another way uh, they call it. It's called eternal security. It's the idea that once you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, He's your Savior for eternity. You're never going to be lost after that point. It doesn't matter. I've had, I've had Christians who believe this tell me that it doesn't matter if they curse God to His face, if they brow down and worship Satan, it doesn't matter. They've given their heart to Jesus. Now, um, there are some of those that would say that if you are lost, it's because you were never really saved to begin with. And that sounds like, you know, it's, it's an easy way out. But, I mean, somebody had a genuine walk with God. For years, they loved Jesus. They, 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 they were faithful to the Lord. They obeyed every commandment that they knew how. And they just, they had a heart to serve the Lord. They, they treated others with love and kindness. They, the miracle of their life showed that they were converted and then something happened. I don't know, maybe they went to college and they got doubt. Or maybe their wife died and, and they just got discouraged and gave up on God. And when that happened, they say, but, but they, they weren't ever saved originally. Because if they were really saved, they would never have turned, turned back. But really, that's not what the Bible says. The question was, where did it come from? First of all, um, Christians really did not believe this idea of once saved, always saved for you know, more than a thousand years of the Christian church. Um, during the Reformation, when people got the Bibles back in their hands for the first time, they were like, whoa, I'm discovering this, and I'm discovering this. They didn't even know, because, you know, the Bible, it, it, was, it was forbidden to have your own Bible. So when you got your Bible, you're reading through it, like, whoa, I'm not supposed to be confessing my sins to a man. I'm not supposed to be doing this, and this, and this, and this, and all these different things. But then they're realizing, they read some Bible verses, like in the book of Galatians, that may, or, or Romans, how about this one? The Bible says, Romans, that we are predestined. 
And they read these verses about predestination and election, and it kind of appears that, whoa, you know, God chose a long time ago, even in eternity, God chose who's going to be saved, and God chose who's going to be lost. It's not my decision, it's his decision. And so during the Reformation time, you've ever heard of a guy named John Calvin? John Calvin was a man, he wrote these books, the five volumes, the Institutes of the Christian Faith. And, and these, I mean, very, a lot of good stuff in there. But he believed in this idea of election, in that God elected you to be saved. And there's nothing the devil can do about it, nothing you can do about it. You're going to heaven because God chose it. Because God is eternal. God is sovereign. God is so big. God knows the end from the beginning that he knows you're saved, you're saved, you're lost, you're lost, you're saved, you're saved, you're lost. And he knows everybody in the world. It's like a big play that's already been written out. God's the playwright. I mean, we're simply actors doing our parts. The dangerous part of that doctrine is that God would then be deciding who's going to burn in hell and who's going to heaven. That means God arbitrarily... And you could say, well, and by, and by, by the way, uh, when I talk to my friends, there's mostly Presbyterians, and I have some Baptists. You've got particular Baptists, and you've got free will Baptists. The particular Baptists believe that God only chooses a son to be saved. The free will Baptists believe that God chose everybody to be saved, but that we have a choice whether we're going to be or not. So anyway, mostly those are the two groups of people who believe once saved, always saved. And I've talked to them a lot. I mean, I've studied this for years and years, and... Every time I talk to them, it's, it's like, um, you know, well, if I'm, gonna, if, if, if I'm either going to be saved or lost, it doesn't matter, then why do, I, why do I even try to do anything? I'm like, well, that's kind of a good point. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Friends, God chose us all, every person, to be saved. The devil has chosen all of you to be lost, but you've got the deciding vote. Will you be saved or will you be lost? It's up to you. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Amen? The book of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 says, uh, for his, um, it says, my, my brethren, I write these things unto you that you sin not. And if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who uh, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for every human being in this planet. Now, my, my, my friends who don't believe that will say, well, Jesus only died for those that were going to heaven. He didn't die for those that were going to hell. He did not not plan for anybody to go to hell. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, that hell, the purpose of hell is for the devil and his angels, not for any human being. Now, there will be human beings that go to hell, but that's not because God planned that way, planned it that way. So... Once saved, always saved. If somebody comes to you and says, you know, once saved, always saved, there's, there's a couple really good verses, I think, that, that for me um, make it very clear. I'm going to go to one. It's in the book of um, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through a knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than in the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. This verse is very clear. People who know Jesus Christ, who turn back from knowing him, to live for the world, he says it's actually worse for them now that they know than for people who didn't know. Um, in the book of Hebrews, somebody actually brought, brought up the question, what did uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 say? Remember, that's the one that says for, um, um, now let me just read it here, it's in front of me. Uh, for if we sin willfully after that we've received a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. You know, and you can back up to Hebrews chapter 6, and it says here, uh, for it's impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Do these people have the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. So these people evidently were, lo were saved who then became lost. All right, that was Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. By the way, 
the reason it's impossible for them to be saved again is not that, that they've fallen, it's they've fallen away. That word fallen away means apostia. It's, it's, I think I pronounced that correctly. It's the word apostate. They have, they have completely become reprobate in their minds and have shut down the Holy Spirit so much that, that they cannot be saved. Um, just simply because they can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit convicting them. Um, there's several verses in the Bible. We read one the other day in the book of Hebrew, or book of uh, Ezekiel, chapter 18, um, talking about the soul that sins, it shall die. You know, the child is not going to be held responsible for his parents' sin, and his sin, the parents not going to be held responsible for his child's sin. So, those are some verses to keep in mind about that. Um, but the Bible is very clear that we are saved not by our works, but we are saved by our personal faith in Jesus. A, a faith that trusts in the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? Because he does not, we're not saved because of the faith of Jesus. Right? I mean, Jesus would have everybody saved. He wants us to acknowledge him as our Lord and Savior. He wants us to confess him as our Lord and Savior. And he wants us to trust him as our Lord and Savior. And that's something he won't make us do. It's something he lets us do for ourselves. So now we're not saving ourselves. He's the one that does the saving, but we've got to believe in that power to save. So there's a lot of other verses in the Bible that help support this idea. But Bible, some people say, well, the Bible says, no man will pluck him out of my hand. And that's true. When you're in the hand of the Lord, there's nothing that can pluck you out of the Lord's hand except your decision to leave. God's hand is not a prison house that you can't leave, right? We studied about free will on the second night of this seminar, third night of the seminar. We studied about the, the power of free will, that God gave the angels free will, that we, you and I have free will. God doesn't want people to have to go to heaven, right? He wants people who want to go to heaven. So anyway, that's, that's that attempt to answer that question. Um, do you think that the uh, Roman Catholic Church is in fact the Illuminati? Um, well, the Illuminati, by definition, is a secret society, and they're secretive. I don't know. Um, there's been speculation that, um, oh, what's that guy's name who started the Illuminati? Joseph something? Um, I can't remember now, but anyway, there, there's, this, there's this idea, Weissoff, was it? Weissoff, yeah, that's his name. There's this idea that, um, that basically the Catholic Church, being the biblical antichrist, has worked over time to try to get attention off of itself. And so the, there has been these secret societies that have sprung up, whether it's through Masonry, the Illuminati, uh, or various other different you know, uh, groups, and that would distract, you know, that you, we got the Bilderbergers, or the, uh, what's this other one you got? Um, oh, there's another one out there. But these, these big-name, controlling, Rockefeller-type groups, that, 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 you know, they're the ones that make all, call in all the shots and the big things and the governments and the money control and, and all these ideas. But here's my thought. And I, can, and I could be wrong because, you know, who knows what's in the, going, behind, going on behind closed doors except God. My thought is this, that Satan doesn't care how you're lost. Right? His ultimate goal is to get you distracted from following Jesus. He's working through the entity of the Roman Catholic Church as his front man to be able to do his dirty work and get people distracted. It looks close enough to Christianity to deceive people to think it is Christianity. And so millions, if not billions, of people will be lost simply because of that influence. But there are people that are thinking people who will not basically fall for certain deceptions. So Satan says, okay, i got a way to get those guys too. And so he raises up these secret societies that become, um, I don't know, I mean, they, they, a lot of them carry the forms of Catholicism. Um, I'm, you know, I'm told that, but, but, there's, but there's a separation. The Jesuit group, you know, historically they've been workers to undo everything that Protestantism has done. And um, so whether it's the Jesuits or the Masons, the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, all these different groups that uh, are all these controlling, powerful groups, Satan's ultimately the head of all of them. And, you know, if, if they're all employees of Satan, including the Catholic Church, uh, where one starts and the other ends, I don't know. And frankly, I don't care. I think it's important, friends, that we don't get distracted. And that's what those groups are designed to do. They're designed to get us distracted from the mission that God has given us. You know, 
we could name every 33rd degree Mason out there, find out every top leader in the, in the uh, Illuminati, and what, what's it going to do us? What good is it going to do us? Nothing, right? You know, if we follow the Bible, you know, you know the, the Secret Service are responsible for uh, finding counterfeit you know, bills and the, talking about the, the currency. You know, they study the genuine $100 bill <clears throat> excuse me, so thoroughly that when they see a counterfeit, they immediately recognize it. They don't have to, I mean, they don't, they don't have time to study every single counterfeit that's ever made in the world, right? There's so many different methods of counterfeiting and all these false things. They study the genuine so that any counterfeit shows up, obviously. Friends, we need to study our Bibles so that any time there's a counterfeit comes along, boom, we're going to recognize it. Tonight, we're going to discover a genuine truth from the Bible that's going to allow you to discover what counterfeit is out there. So there's a couple more questions that came in. Um, I had one that was came in through text. I want to... It says, um, since the Jews rejected Jesus, uh, they're still looking for the Messiah. Uh, when did their daily and yearly sacrifices end? I kind of addressed that, but somebody said, you know, I want more details about that. The simple answer is this. A.D. 70, you know, the Jews continued practicing sacrifices and offerings. But when A.D. 70 came and, uh, and Rome came and destroyed the temple destroyed and knocked it completely down. From that point forward, even the Jewish people have not offered sacrifices and offerings because, excuse me, because they don't have a temple. And so they say that we're, they're not going to resume sacrifices and offerings until they have a temple again. So that's, that's the short answer to that. AD 70 was when that stopped. Um, that's a good question here, but I'm not going to address it tonight. Uh, it deals with uh, the question of gender identity. And uh, you want to hear me? Try to address that. Come tomorrow night. I'll, I'll try to address it then. Let's get into our presentation tonight, or into our study tonight. We still have a quiz, and we're running out of time already. All right. Tonight we're going to be giving away uh, this book, Grave Errors About Death. Grave Errors About Death. And possibly, do we have another one of those Revelation Bride Beast and Babylon DVDs? Perhaps we can give one away along with this tonight. Okay, we'll do that. All right, so... Uh, oh. You know, every once in a while, I think it's, it's, it's prudent for me to give a thanks to those who have given um, in those envelopes. Uh, some of you guys have been doing that faithfully, and, and the Lord bless you for that. I mean, it, you know, um, these, these things wouldn't happen without support, and um, we don't beg for it. I promise you I never would. But boy, when people give, you sure want to say thank you, because it is meaningful, and it is recognized. So, thank you, or mercy, or danku, or mahala, and... All those words in different languages. All right, let's get into our quiz, guys. We studied on Saturday night the mark of the beast, and we also studied U.S. and prophecy. Let's find uh, out if we know, if we remember anything we learned Saturday night. True or false, the mark of the beast is a literal mark in the forehead or the hand. The mark of the beast is a literal mark in the forehead or hand. Question two, name one of the identifying marks of God's people who do not receive the mark of the beast. This is a tough question, but remember we talked about um, different things that people would be doing to be sure that they would not get the mark of the beast. What would be one of those identifying marks of God's people who do not receive the mark of the beast? Question three, what are three elements or parts that a seal must consist of? What are three elements or parts that, must, that uh, a seal must consist of? And uh, question four, according to the beast's power, what is their mark of authority? So if you were to ask the beast, Mr. Beast, what's your mark? What's the mark of the beast according to the beast's power? And then last question in Revelation 13, who is the second beast with lamb-like horns who speaks like a dragon? I think this is the... Only quiz in my seminar where I have almost all the questions are fill in the blank and not uh, true or false. So, I see some people, maybe I went a little fast there, I see some people still writing. I got another question that came in too, and I, is this still in my pocket? It is. Can anyone hear the audible voice of God today? I'm going to try to address that one tomorrow as well. All right, guys. Question one, true or false? The mark of the beast is a literal mark in the forehead or hand. True or false? Ah, 
It is false. We learned that the mark of the... Oh, I got a sixth question. I forgot about my sixth question. Wait a minute. We're going to get to that question one in just a minute. This is the only quiz I have my whole seminar where I have six questions too. So forgive me for uh, forgetting to mention. I just write down the number six and put it in your own line there. Here's the question. This is a true or false question. According to prophecy, church and state will unite and enforce religious laws. Church and state will unite and enforce religious laws according to prophecy. Okay. Now we're ready to go to question number one. And it is, you, said, you guys said false. I agree with you. It is false. Uh, the mark of the beast, we learned, is a symbolic mark. Well, the beast is symbolic, right? Now, somebody's going to have a question about symbolism versus uh, literalism. Well, the mark, the, the beast itself, it's not, a, it's not a literal beast. But the literal beast is symbolic, or excuse me, the beast is symbolic of a literal power. Does that make sense? So the mark is not a literal mark, but it is symbolic of a literal test, a literal issue, a, 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 a sign that's going to distinguish, a literal sign that's going to distinguish God's people from the beast people. The beast people. They should... Sounds like a, I don't know, the beast people. I could make a sermon title out of that. Question two, name one of the identifying marks of God's people who do not receive the mark of the beast. What do you say? What's something they're doing that would keep them? You're talking about receiving the seal of God. That's right, that's right. If you have the seal of God, you won't get the mark of the beast. But what is the seal of God? Observance of the Sabbath, that's right. Yeah, the Sabbath is God's sign. Um, any other thing you want to suggest for an answer to this? Anybody? Following the, Following the commandments? Patience? Well, that yeah, word there we talked about means endurance. I wrote down, keeps the commandments or has the faith of Jesus. Remember it says, um, here's the patience of this. Here's the ones that talk about don't get the mark of the beast. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God, which includes the Sabbath, so you're not wrong on that, and has the faith of Jesus. So we need the faith of Jesus, and we need to keep, keep it as commandments. Question three, what three elements must a, uh, a seal consist of? One element from over here. Okay, the territory. One, one, uh, anybody over here got an answer? A title. Anybody over here got an answer? What is it? Well, he, she mentioned location or authority, the, the area of dominion. It's a name. You guys got it. So name, title, and territory. You guys got it. Okay, question four. According to the beast power, what is their mark of authority? Sunday sacred. That's exactly right. That's a, what, right, just what I put. Sunday sacredness. It was, it's this idea, the sun, the, the, this idea that Sunday is now the church's holy day taking the place of God's holy day, they, that they believe they have the power to change that. They said that change from Saturday to Sunday is the mark of our authority. The yeah, well, th well, that's what, yeah. So basically, when they begin to enforce that and telling people that, that if you don't have the mark or if you don't, uh, you know, keep the Sunday sacredness, if you don't recognize that, you will be persecuted you will be ostracized. You will ultimately receive the death decree. Now, I believe God may intervene and protect you from dying, but you know, they're going to try to kill all those that are faithful to God's law. Question five. In Revelation 13, who's the second beast with lamb-like horns who speaks like a dragon? Yes, I believe that's the United States of prophecy. And, there, and you know, I, just putting all the things there, I have never found another possible fulfillment of this. There is, it's, just, it's just not out there. There's no other option. Question six, true or false, according to prophecy, church and state will unite and enforce religious laws. That is true, and we call that the image of the beast. All right, Daniel, let's pick these things up. Make sure your name is on there. And did you have that DVD? Aha. Excellent. While they're picking these up, let me make a quick announcement here. Tomorrow night... It's part two of our little... See, to, are, Daniel, are we giving something away for those that come tonight, tomorrow, and Friday? Okay. We, what, you know what it is? I don't know what it is. Oh, okay. They, 
It's a, it's a Daniel, it's not up here, it's Daniel and Revelation uh, magazine. It's, it's going to be a, um, this really neat, full color, little commentary thing, goes through the book of Daniel and through the book of Revelation, really fun. Um, anyway, everybody who comes tonight, Tuesday, and Friday will receive one while supplies last. Tonight, Tuesday, and Friday. So you got to come here early if you want to get one. So if you come tonight, Tuesday, or Friday, you'll get, um, yeah, you'll, be, uh, uh, you'll get this magazine. Here it is. I told you it was cool, didn't I? Look at that. And uh, you, you recognize that? Look at that. And uh, but anyway, it's just it's it's full color. It's just really neat little um, study through Daniel and Revelation, uh, the four horsemen, the apocalypse are in there, and some other things I haven't been able to study throughout the seminar. So everybody gets one who comes tonight, Tuesday and Friday, while supplies last. All right. Oh, that's that's tomorrow. Then on uh, we take Wednesday, Thursday off, and then we're gonna come back on Friday at six thirty. Revelation's hottest topic, and then on Saturday morning. I've got uh, a presentation I'm going to share called Survival Keys for the End Times. Survival Keys for the End Times. And, uh, but even before that, I got a very special presentation called Joyful Sabbaths. That's at 9.30. So normally they have like a class in here called Sabbath School. But I said, let's hijack Sabbath School and let's do a special class just for those coming to the seminar. Um, and it's called, spe- it's called um, Joyful Sabbaths. And it's going to be actually shared by... Um, Pastor Dave, if, you ever got, if you've got to know him, he's going to teach that class, and it's going to be more of an interactive class. That's at 9.30, and then my presentation follows at 11. All right. All right we got two drawings. Two drawings, and whoever draw, wins first gets to pick which one they want. All right, Kelly, Kelly Arnett. Yes, come on up. All right, yes. Which one do you want, my friend? The DVD or this one? Oh, that, that's okay. That's going to be fun. Yes, it's a fun book right there. All right. It's Grave Errors About Death. And then Jonah. All right, brother. Good deal. The Lord's blessing this man right here. All right. There you go, friend. Enjoy that. Okay. My clicker's over here. Uh-oh. That's my announcement to turn my phone down. How about you guys? I'll... Uh, yeah, that, that's actually a really good time because if it would have happened another minute from now, I'd be really embarrassed. Okay, let's study. But before we do, let's go through our motto. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't need it. Let's pray. Father, I humble myself before you this evening as, uh, as a teacher of your word. Lord, I just don't feel sufficient. I know I'm not sufficient. But you've promised, Lord, that if we should ask, that you would give wisdom, and you would give it very liberally, and you would not hold back. So, Lord, we call out to you for wisdom. I especially call out for wisdom, God, as I teach your word, as I discuss this very important topic that will prepare us for last day deception and how to reject that deception. I ask you, Father, to speak through me. Give me uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. And may we all, Father, have ears to hear this evening and eyes to see and uh, the faith to believe your holy word. I pray in the sacred name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I call tonight's presentation Sorcerers, Demons, and the Dead. Why? Because the subject of death is a very confusing subject among some in which the devil has taken advantage of and has put in place deceptive powers Sorceries, in fact, the Bible says, we're going to read it later, that it's through the power of sorcery that he was able to deceive the whole world. So if the whole world is going to be deceived through the power of sorcery, should we not understand what, you know, whether sorcerers are correct in their ability to communicate with the dead? Or whether demons are involved somehow? Where are the dead? That's our question tonight. Are the dead really dead? I really encourage you to take notes from the Bible. Uh, from our study tonight, mark those things down because I'm going to go pretty fast, but I want you to write these things down, go home, look up these Bible verses and see for yourself because I am persuaded that some of you in the room tonight are going to be shocked to find out what the Bible actually says about the subject of death, where the dead really are. Like this young boy, he's walking uh, through a cemetery on the way back uh, home from school 
And he comes across this one place, a very simple tombstone that simply said, Father. And then the epitaph. Remember, friends, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. Prepare for death and follow me. Well, I don't know if you can look below that there, but that young boy reading that poem on that tombstone, he wasn't very comforted by that. And he said, you know what? I've got something I want to say. So with his poetic ability, he pulls out a crayon from his backpack and he writes these words. To follow you, I'm not content till I know just which way you went. He did not want to follow aimlessly into the uh, other world. He wanted to know which way he went. What happens to people when they die? That is a question that not just believers, but even unbelievers have often been asking. Does consciousness cease? Does life go on? What does the afterlife look like? People want to know, and for good reason. You know, some people are granted a long life here on this planet. Praise the Lord. Others are granted a short life. But after death, it is a mystery that people want to solve. There's been more movies and, and books written about the afterworld in, in science fiction and other things than almost any other theme. Revelation chapter 118, we don't have to guess about what comes after. In fact, we know somebody who's been there. Look at this right here. It says, I am he, Jesus says, that lives and was what? Dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen? I don't know if that was a question he asked, but he said amen. And have the keys of Hades and death. So right here, according to the Bible, Jesus has passed through the portals of the tomb. He knows what's on the other side. He has experienced it himself, and he is alive to tell us about it. And not just that, he himself has the keys. Now, why, does he, why, why would a person have a key? What's the point of a key? To unlock, to open, right? To open a door. You see, there are people... He says that are in the grave that he has the key and the ability to unlock the grave and get people out. I like that idea. I like the idea of serving one who has the key of death and hell. And Jesus, who understands the subject. Now, what kind of nature does man possess naturally? As we try to understand the subject of death, let's try to figure out life. What does it mean to be alive? What kind of nature do we possess naturally? Is it mortal or is it immortal? Before you answer, because many of us have been taught one thing our whole lives, maybe one, maybe the other, but regardless of what we've been taught, we're going to look at tonight, what does the Bible say? First, a definition. What does the word mortal mean? Of a living human being, often in contrast to a divine being, subject to death. Mortal means basically you can die. Immortal, on the other hand, means living forever. Never dying or decaying. So, immortal is one who cannot die. So as we think about who has immortality, well, the Bible actually gives us an answer to that question. It says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the, Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only has what? Immortality. And then it says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. So I ask the question again, are we mortal or are we immortal now that we've seen some Bible verses that deal with the subject? What do you say? Well, biblically speaking, we would be mortal. Here's some other verses that actually support that teaching. Job chapter 4, verse 17. It says, shall mortal man be more just than God? It says man or mankind is mortal. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says that he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. And then you also read in 2 Corinthians 4, 11 that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So while we are mortal now, he gives us the gift of immortality by, in, by um, earnest right now. The Bible says that it, he who has the Son has life, right? So he's given us the gift of eternal life, but when do we actually receive that gift? That's the question, friends. And here in the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 15, there is a time that we receive the gift of immortality. 
And in uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 7, it says, We seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. We seek for that. And then we turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 53 to 54. And I think we're actually going to read that later in the, in, the, um, in the study today. But it says very clearly that for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When does that happen? It says, at the last trump, when the trumpet shall sound. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4 makes it clear. Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. Notice this. The soul that sinneth, it shall... Let's see that again, the yellow part together. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. I'm going to ask you a very obvious question that the majority of people are confused about. Can a soul die? Now, if you've been taught your whole life that this soul is immortal, then this verse is creating this thing in you um, uh, that is, uh, it's, it's hard to hear. It's hard to receive. It's like, I know that souls are immortal, but the Bible says it's mortal. What do I do? Cognitive dissonance is the word. It's hearing something different than you've ever heard before, and your mind just starts doing backflips saying, hey, hey, what's up with that? You, ever, you guys ever watch that YouTube video of the guy who gets on the backwards bicycle? He turns it right, the, the wheel goes left. He turns it left, the wheel goes right. And it took him months to be able to learn how to uh, ride that bike. You know, you think it was just like riding a bike. It wasn't. And, um, that, of course, there was a study on neuroplasticity and the power of the brain to adapt. But the fact is, it's hard to understand something different than you ever heard before. And you, you, to try to think through a different, um, or see through a different lens or think through a different way. And, but yet the Bible says the soul that sins shall die. Souls can die. Now, what is the soul? What is the soul? Some people have some pretty, Hollywood ver pretty weird Hollywood versions about the soul. I know when I became a Christian, I had some pretty strange ideas about the soul. Why? Because when I was in witchcraft, the soul was not part of, it wasn't me, the soul was part of me. The soul was something in me that when you died, poof, you've heard of astral projection? This idea of the soul leaving the body? That's something that I believed in and that was possible, uh, but it wasn't, you know, of course, biblical. It was really paganistic in its, in its, in its origin of that thinking. And, um, and you know, I, but, then I had, but I was very confused because when I became a Christian, I'm trying to undo a lot of those old thinkings old thoughts. But it took me some time. In fact, when I first became a Christian, I was so confused about some things. I thought that when you died, you became an angel. Well, not quite yet. You see, you had to earn your wings. Because I watched a movie called It's a Wonderful Life. And there, there was this angel who had to earn his wings. And then at the very end of the movie, remember that little girl? There's a bell rang there on the Christmas tree. She says, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. And, you know, that's so classic, and everybody loves that movie. But, you know, the reality is, it's unbiblical. But I believed it because, you know, hey, I thought that's what Christians are supposed to believe. And I had to learn that that's not what the soul is. We are not, um, uh, we, don't, we don't possess a soul. We have a soul. I'm going to show you, or we are a soul. Let me show you that from the Bible. Uh, going back to Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. Creation of man is going to give us an insight about death because death is the opposite of life. So what happened when God first made man? Imagine this. There you have Adam. He's laid out on the ground. What is he? I mean, he's dust that God had formed, made into a body. What did that body have? I mean, it had veins and arteries. You know, it had muscles. It had organs. It had a liver and, and intestines and a heart and lungs. It had a brain. It had feet and toes and toenails. What didn't it have? It didn't have life. It had a heart that wasn't beating. It had a lungs that wasn't breathing. What happened to create a life? A brain that was not thinking. There was no electricity going through the mind. How, what, what, what would God do to create that life? All right, here we have it in Genesis 2, verse 7. We don't have to guess, praise the Lord. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of of life and man became a living soul man became a living soul was he a soul before that no you see god did not find a soul off some conveyor belt in heaven and say whoop i'll put that one here whoop, i'll get that one here like some of the hollywood would portray right 
No, this idea that, that, that we pre-existed our bodies, that is a pagan idea. We did not come into existence until we were born, or at least until we were conceived. And so, according to this verse right here, God combined the dust of the ground to create a body, and the breath of the air, sometimes called the Spirit of God, those two things together created in man life. It created a living soul. Notice he didn't put a soul in him. He became a soul. Did you notice that? That is very important to understand because the opposite of, of life here is death. And look what happens, how the Bible describes this process of death. After man sinned, God said there's a consequence for sin. The soul that sins shall die. Here's what God told Adam. He says, in the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Do you see that? The body, even though it was living, it's functioning, it's moving, when it dies, it goes back down to the ground. And by the way, physiologically speaking, isn't that exactly what happens? When you take a body, you put it back in the ground, or even if you want to speed up the process through cremation, what happens? Ashes to ashes and dust to dust, just like the Bible says. Job 27, verse 3, All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now, parallelism. Basically, in poetry, you read, basically, they say the same thought in two different ways. You read the book of Psalms, Proverbs, here in Ecclesiastes, you see this, this repetition of thought. He says it one way, then he says it another way. Very important to understand. He says, all the while my breath is in me, the Spirit of God is my nostrils. He's saying the breath that's in him is the Spirit of God. Now, is the Spirit of God talking about the Holy Spirit? No, the Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead that's entirely separate, okay? This Spirit of God is the, the word spirit there, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The word spirit is the word breath. In fact, if you have a Bible there with a margin in it, it actually will say the breath which God gave him. So the breath that's in him is the breath of God. God gives life. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. When you die, what happens to the body? It goes back to dust, right? What happens to the spirit or the breath? It goes back to God. Here it is. Then the dust will return to earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So the spirit returns back to God. Now, pause. Most people who read this are reading this verse and thinking the spirit that goes back to God is the soul. Well, we've already established that the soul is the person. They say, well, maybe, if it, maybe it's not the soul. Maybe the spirit that goes back to God is their mind or, or their spiritual nature. Somehow something goes back to God when we die. And the answer is, yes, there is, but it's not your mind. It's not your thinking. It's not your conscience. What goes back to God? What Your spirit, which is your what? Breath. That's what goes back to God when you die. Where did that spirit come from? God. Right there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. By the way, notice this. It's every person when they die, their body goes back to the ground, right? Dust to dust. It doesn't matter if you're Hitler or you're, I don't know, think of the nicest, sweetest saint you know, right? I don't want to start picking on saints. But it doesn't matter who you are. When you die, you're dead. Your, 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 your body is, is, is dust. The same is true about the breath that's in your body. The same is true about the Spirit of God that's in your body. Not the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God. The breath of God. What's happening is, it's very, very clear, when you die, your breath goes back to God. Whether you're saved or lost. So, if the, if you're, if you're, if the Spirit that goes back to God is your mind... My question is, what about all the wicked people? Do all their minds go back to God too? That's not what the Bible's saying. The spirit that goes back to God is simply the breath of God. In fact, in the Hebrew here, the word spirit is the word ruach. You have to get you spit in somebody's eye to be able to say it right. It's used 377 times in the King James Version Bible. It's translated 117 times as wind or air, 33 times as breath, and 227 times as a spirit. So the spirit, breath, wind, air, all interchangeable. My point is when it's describing the human body, the body, the human creation in the beginning, and death whenever we come to the end of our life, 
It's talking not about the spiritual side of things. It's talking about, excuse me, it's talking about the breath that God has given us to live. Here's an example in Psalm 146, verse 4. His breath, or ruach, goeth forth. He returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. So if the breath or the spirit is the thoughts, they're supposed to go back to God, then my question is, why did his thoughts perish? You see, because the thought, the, the, the spirit and breath is simply the power or life-giving force of God. It's not your conscience. The soul or spirit cannot live in a conscious form apart from the body. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, it says, The dust goes back to the earth, the spirit goes back to God who gave it. This is everybody. Is that clear? The wicked and the righteous. So I'm going I'm to do a math equation. You guys good at math? All right. <laughs> this is simple math, okay, using Bible terminology. In the beginning, when God made man, he, took, he takes the body, he adds to it breath, and what do you have? A living soul. That's the, that's the math, okay? Well, to be able to check your answers, remember back in school when you'd check your answers? You've got to reverse the problem here, okay? So you have a body, you minus breath, what do you have? Death, right? This is a simple way to prove this. I mean, this equation is, is, is absolutely biblically true. And we can prove it by simply holding our breath long enough. Anybody, anybody, want, to, anybody want to volunteer to try? Don't, don't volunteer to try. This death is the result of not breathing. Breath is what God has given each one of us to live. So the soul is the life. The soul is the person. The soul is the living being. In fact, some of your Bible translations know this very clearly. So they say, God, you know, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living person, a living being. That's what it is talking about here. All right, take a light bulb, for example. All right, so I want you to ex imagine for me, uh, with me for a moment, what a light bulb is. A light bulb is simply a glass case. Inside is a filament. Can a light bulb put off light by itself? It's like Adam's body laying there, right? It's just an empty vessel. But God, well, what, what, what do I have to do to get the light to turn on? I've I got to plug it in, right? So if I, if I plug in the light, the, I, all of a sudden what happens? Boom, the light comes on. Does that make sense? You take, you take power, electricity, combine it with the bulb, and what do you have? Light, okay? Now, the opposite is exactly true as well. If you take the electricity away from the light, what do you have? You have darkness. You, you, you plug it back in, what do you get? You get light. It's very simple, friends. Our body is like the bulb. The electricity is like the, um, the spirit or the breath. Together they create life. Together they create light. Apart, what, what happens? You get darkness. My question is, when you take the electricity away from the bulb, where does the light go? Well, where's the light go? If you, okay, if I'm, in a entire, if I'm in a room that's enclosed 100%, no windows, no doors, n you know, nothing, everything is completely closed in, and in the center of that room, I got a light bulb, and I turn that light bulb off, where does that light go? Huh? Back where it came from. Back where it came from. It goes out, right? It's gone. It's not there anymore. And, you know, it dissipates. It, it's, it's just... It's just not there. The question is this. When you separate the breath of life from the body, where does the soul go? The soul simply, now, now hear me out on this, the soul simply ceases to exist. Now that may be different than anything you've ever heard before. But biblically it's accurate. Biblically it's true. And again, I can show you this, and we're going to see this in the Bible in several places. The good news is this. Before you get up and walk out, the good news is this. God is going to breathe life back into his people again. Even though the soul ceased to exist, it's only a temporary ceasing. It's going to come back to life again in a thing called the resurrection. Amen? The resurrection. Notice that death is the reverse 
of creation. We're going to look at what a soul is. A soul is not, please understand this, a soul is not your spiritual nature. Your soul is not your mind. It's not some kind of entity in you. You know, the, the, the Greeks had this teaching, the Greeks had this idea called, I'm struggling for the word of it, word now, it's, uh, uh, I think it's primordial dualism, if I'm not understanding the, the phrase correctly. This idea that, that we have a, a fleshly nature and we have a spiritual nature. We have the flesh and the soul, and the goal of life is, is to separate the flesh and the soul. The flesh is evil, the soul is good, and we need to feed the soul and, and destroy the flesh. And so they practiced all these wicked abominations because the flesh was evil and there's nothing you could do about it, and the soul was what was good. And so they had all these weird and crazy ideas. Well, the Christians, within the first few centuries after Christianity uh, was established, began to adopt some of these pagan teachings about the soul. When in reality, the Bible is very clear, the soul is you. Here's what we find in the Bible, in the book of Acts, chapter 27, verse 37, and we were in all the ship, 200, three score, and 16, what? Souls. These are, are, are the, <laughs> how about this one, Acts 2.41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That, that, do you have 3,000 ghosts becoming ch- church members? Do we have 276 ghosts on this ship? Is this a ghost ship? A soul is not a disembodied spirit. A soul is a person. And the sooner we understand that, the sooner we can understand the subject of death. You can't baptize ghosts, friends. The soul in the King James Bible is used 1,600 times, but never once is the term immortal soul ever used. Immortal soul is not something you'll ever find in the Bible. It's something that's taught consistently. Almost, In, in fact, it's the fundamental doctrine of many different churches, that the soul is immortal. But that is not the Bible teaching. You'll never find the phrase immortal soul or immortal person or immortal anything other than immortal God. So with knowing this, understanding the history of the death, or a creation, understanding the, what the Bible says about death, I ask again the question, where are the dead? And the Bible has a very simple answer for that. The Bible has a very simple answer. And so Jesus says it in the book of John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29. Jesus says, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Where are the dead when they hear the voice of Jesus at the second coming? The dead are where? Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or condemnation. You see, there is going to be a resurrection day. But when the resurrection happens, people are coming out of their graves. You ask the question, where are the dead? The answer is simply, in the grave. When shall they live again? In the resurrection. Why was the resurrection so important to the early Christians? You know, the, uh, there was a whole denomination of the Jews that did not believe in the resurrection. You, somebody knows their Bible. It's the Sadducees. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> they didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe this, that this idea of a miraculous living again. They thought it was it. The, when you reject the resurrection teaching... You know, the Pharisees had a lot of problems, but they believed in the resurrection. And oftentimes they would come and try to, not the Pharisees, but the Sadducees would come and try to trap Jesus up in this teaching about the resurrection. He was always straightening them out. Why is the resurrection so important for Christians? Because we serve a risen Savior, right? We serve a, a Jesus who rose up literally out of the grave to new life. And not just that, friends, we have given, got, we've received from Jesus promise after promise after promise that we too, though we die, we will yet live again. And that's why the resurrection is a fundamental teaching of the Christian church. In fact, you can read Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2. It tells you there, the resurrection is a fundamental teaching. Resurrection, friends. This is not being preached about anymore. Why? Because people don't understand what happens to people when they die. 
The reason the, re- the teaching of the resurrection has been passed by, and most Christians today are like Sadducees, they don't believe in a resurrection. They believe that people go immediately to heaven when they die. Not in a resurrection, but now. Now, if that's what you believe or that's what you've been taught, I'm asking you tonight to, to, to hold that thought and hear the scriptures share with you this teaching about the resurrection that is going to completely undermine this idea of immediately at death reward. The reward comes at the resurrection. I'm going to show you that from the Bible. Let's first look in Acts 17, 18. He preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Paul was a preacher of the resurrection. They didn't like that. It says, and when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear you again in this matter. It's the same thing that happens to me. I tell Christians all over, I say, I believe in the resurrection, and they mock me for it. What do you mean you mock me for teaching the resurrection? Well, because we go to heaven when we die, not at the resurrection. I'm saying, friends, have you read your Bibles? It talks about the resurrection. They mock Paul for teaching this idea of the resurrection of the dead. Acts 23, verse 6, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I'm called into question. Acts 24, verses 14 and 15, but this I confess to thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. By the way, let me pause there. If they call you a heretic, you know what you do? If anybody calls you a heretic for believing the Bible truth, you say, well, you know what? If I'm a heretic, so is Paul. (laughs) They They may say, I'm teaching heresy, but they said the same thing about the Apostle Paul, too. You know, Jesus said, he says, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so they did of all the false prophets. He says, but blessed are you, right, when they shall cast out your name as evil. Whenever they, they, they throw you out of the synagogue for my name's sake. Whenever they call you evil names. Listen, that's, that's, say, I'm blessed. Don't be afraid of being called names for following Jesus. It's going to get a lot worse than that. So I confess this to thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and the prophets. Do you believe all things written in the law and the prophets? You better, friends. And have hope toward God that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Two resurrections, in fact. We're going to be reading about that in a little bit. The resurrection of the dead. This is the hope that you and I have, friends. The resurrection of the dead. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise when? First, when are we going to see our loved ones in Christ? At the shout. At the voice of the archangel. That is when we see our dead loved ones. Not until. The second coming of Jesus is when the resurrection happens. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Every time I share the message about the rapture or the message about the second coming of Christ, I read this verse, I have people always asking me, where are the dead in Christ? Biblically speaking, the dead in Christ are dead. I didn't make it up. That's what the Bible says. The dead in Christ are dead. They're in their graves, and they will live again. When? When were they going to live again? When the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout. Has the Lord descended from heaven with a shout yet? That means the dead in Christ are still dead. Isn't that what that says? goes on to say, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now here's the thing. Verse 18 says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Here's what happens. You go to a funeral. Has anybody in here ever been to a funeral? Okay, I'm sure every single person has been to a funeral, and probably more than once for some of you. And there's sad events. I hate preaching a funeral. But I go to a funeral, sometime of unbelievers, sometimes just various different churches and whatever, whoever's leading out, and sometimes it's just the chaplain of the of the mortuary, and they go and they'll preach this this strong message about where grandma. When my um, I have a relative, a family member who died, not going to give a name, and when he died, you know he was a he was a big hunter, he was a big fisher. And this preacher, that's, he basically got about a five-minute rundown about who this person was that he's preaching about. And so during his sermon, as I'm sitting there, I'm on the second row, and I, I'm looking clear. This young man, he's preaching his heart out. 
And he says, and I want you to imagine right now him up there in heaven on the streets of gold dancing a jig. He's up there right now on the river of life casting his reel in there and fishing away. He's up there hunting around. And, I, and there's this idea that somehow Grandpa was up there uh, 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 you know, having a blast right as we are speaking. And then you go out by the graveside. It's a very solemn time as that body is being lowered down into that grave. Before they lower him down, they give another little sermonette. And the preacher says, and now we're laying this brother to rest where he is sleeping sweetly in the arms of Jesus. He is now in Abraham's bosom. He is now, and, I, I, and all, all these phrases, and, and the, you know, the, the, he's with the angels and all these different things. And my idea is that like, oh, do, you, are you even, do you have an idea or a clue where this guy is? You say he's in heaven, you say he's in the grave, you say he's right there in the casket, you say he's in the arms of Jesus, he's in Abraham's bosom, where's he at? But you know, here's the thing. When the preachers preach this, what are they trying to do? Why, are, why do they say these things? You, I heard it. To comfort. To make people feel better. Right? And, it, and frankly, it doesn't matter how wicked or sinful the person has been, they're always preached right into heaven. You ever notice that? They're always going to heaven. And that teaches, by the way, anybody going to the funerals, it doesn't matter what you do, you're always direct shot. But here's my problem. I've, I've, well, I have several problems with that. For one, the Bible tells us here, I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. The comfort with which we should be comforting one another is not preaching people into heaven, is to preach the second coming. We are to comfort people with this idea of the resurrection. That's where we're supposed to comfort one another. Now, you may like the idea that grandma's up there in heaven looking down on you. I don't like that idea. I like my personal space. I don't like grandma seeing me all the time. You know? I don't, I don't like the idea of grandma looking down and seeing me suffering or going through a hard time. You know? Yep. Exactly. Can I get some privacy? You know? That, I don't, that, that, that does, that's not very comforting to me. It may be for you, but it's not for me. Well, you know, brother, that, that actually that makes me mad when somebody says that. Whenever, whenever, especially when a child dies, and somebody says to that parent, God needed her more than you. I, I, my, woo! I want to get out the whip of cords and start running some people out of the temple. You know, it just makes me mad because, you know, frankly, God did not kill that child. God is not responsible for the death of that innocent child. God did not need her more than you. Death is an enemy. The Bible says death is an enemy, not a friend to be wanted. Oh, friends, I, I just I hate it when people say that. I really do. That's, a, that's not my point today. When are we going to see our loved ones again? When Jesus comes. Now, what does the Bible teach about the condition of man in death? Let's see if the Bible supports what I just shared with you. All right, David, King David. If there's ever going to be a saint in heaven, King David's going to be it, right? I mean, this was a godly man. Sure, he did some bad things, but then he began. God converted him, changed him. He lived out the rest of his life in, 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 in honor and truth and righteousness. God said, this is a man after my own heart. But the Bible says in Acts 2.34, for David is not ascended into the heavens. Some people say, well, when Jesus died, he went down into the grave and he fought the devil and, and he won people and brought them into heaven. I said, well, we guess he leave David behind, right? This is the book of Acts. Jesus was already in heaven. Why is David still dead? This righteous man of God. David is not ascended into the heavens. In fact, it says in Acts 2, verse 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. It doesn't say he was dead. It says he is dead. David is dead. Why? Because he has not experienced the resurrection yet. By the way, Jesus did not go into the, uh, uh, some kind of hell and fought the devil off when he died. That is a, a terrible, perverted teaching that is nowhere found in the entire Bible. When Jesus died, guess what happened to Jesus? He was dead. He was in the grave. For three days and on the third day, he rose to life again. <laughs> well, I mean, the fact is, uh, he died on Friday and was in the tomb all day Saturday, so I guess he was resting on the Sabbath in his death, just like he rested on the Sabbath during his creation. So even in creation and redemption, Jesus was resting. But that's beside the point. Um, but the fact is that Jesus was dead. 
He was not alive during that time. He did not come alive. He, didn't, he was not resurrected until that Sunday morning. And we have more to say on that in just a little bit. But David is dead. He is buried. Ecclesiastes 9, 5. For the living know that they shall die. Finish the rest with me. But the dead know not anything. The dead know not anything, friends. If you want to ask, how much does so-and-so know who's already died? You can go to this Bible verse and say, they know this much. Not anything. It doesn't matter if it's Einstein who knew so much while on this earth. Right now, he knows nothing. It doesn't matter who it is. They know nothing. Why? Because they're dead. Now, the living know that they're going to die because they can think. But the people who are dead can't think because they don't have a mind. Their mind is dead. But there will be a resurrection day. Job 7, 9, and 10. As the cloud is consumed and vanishes away, so he that goes down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. When you die, you don't go back to your house. There's no haunted houses out there. All these movies and, and shows that are making money off of haunted houses, boy, they'd be out of business if they knew this Bible verse. They don't, the, the people die or dead. They're not going back and haunting houses. Why, did, why, would, uh, uh, why would somebody who die go back to their house and come around as a little Casper ghost and, woo, and scare people? What's the point? It's ridiculous, friends. It's not biblical. He shall return no more to his house. Why? Because he's dead. Now, somebody asked about, well, if it's not spirits, there's obviously some things out there that's going on pretty weird, hauntings and such things. It is. It's not dead souls that are haunting houses. It would be demons, if at all. Now, I would say most, the grand majority, okay, I'm, I'm from Missouri. Uh, one of the prisons I was talking about the other day when my testimony is Missouri State Penitentiary. It has since closed down a few years back. And so now they put tours through that, that prison. And they bring in these big old... Uh, um, big, uh, I don't know what you call them, Hollywood shows and come in and they start doing these ghost hunting adventures and try to, and they, and they see like a little speck of light. Oh, it was one, we saw one. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. It must be a soul of a departed prisoner that was stabbed to death. You know what? They make some probably some pretty good money. I don't know how, but they make some good money doing that kind of stuff. But biblically speaking, it's nothing. And, I, and, and really... I don't think the devil really haunts houses either. I mean, he may put some demons in there to make people think that the dead are alive, right? But, but he, he doesn't care. Satan's goal is to cause you to be lost. And if he can convince you that the dead are alive, guess what? You can believe that they can communicate with you and you can believe their lies. We've got to understand what happens to people when they die or we will be deceived in these last days. Psalm 115, verse 7. Oh, actually, I didn't read this one yet. It says in Job 6, verse 5, For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Now, let me ask you a question. If you died and went straight to heaven, I, I believe you guys are faithful Christians. You're going to die uh, one day if, unless Jesus comes first. And let's say you die and you went straight to heaven without passing go, without collecting $200. Boom, you're there. What's the first thing you would do when you got there? Yeah, you would probably throw your arms around the, Jesus' feet and not let him go for a millennium, right? I mean, this guy, I mean, you love him so much. You appreciate being there so much. You're going to praise him. You're going to thank him. You're going to say, praise you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for getting me here. And yet, what's the Bible say happens to saints when they die? For in death there is no remembrance of thee, and in the grave who shall give thee thanks? When you die, you can't thank Jesus. When you die, you can't praise him. Why? Because you're dead. And you're not thinking. Psalm 115, 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. We're not going to praise God when we die. We're going to praise God when we're resurrected. Psalm 146, verse 4. His breath goes forth. Remember, that's the Spirit of God that's in your, in your nostrils. That's how, by the way, that's how you know it's not the Holy Spirit. That's how you know it's not your conscience. Because the Spirit is where? In the nostrils. Okay, You know it's talking about the breath, right? So his breath goes forth. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts. You don't think more in death. You think nothing in death. So here you have a summary here. The dead know nothing. The dead praise not the Lord. The dead do not remember God. Their thoughts perish. So the dead are dead. 
This is a fundamental Bible teaching that has been so perverted and confused that the world today, many people today, believe that the dead are alive. And these people who believe the dead are alive will be deceived by the sorceries of Satan in these last days. When will we receive our rewards? Will we receive it at death or will we receive our rewards at the resurrection? Uh, as I told you earlier in that funeral, uh, my relative there was up in heaven, received his reward already. Is that what the Bible says? When do we get our rewards? Jesus taught us very clearly in the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. He says, But when thou makest a feast, <clears throat> call the poor, for they cannot repay you. Recompense means repay. For they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Remember, there's two resurrections. The resurrection of the just is the first one. And it's then, friends, that we receive our rewards. That's when we receive our repayments. Matthew 16, 27 says it like this. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father and with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. When, friends? When Jesus comes with his rewards. We are not going to get rewarded at death. We're going to get rewarded at the second coming. Because it's at the second coming, that's whenever we are resurrected. Okay? The Bible compares death to a sleep. Now, when I was a little boy, my dad owned a restaurant. And uh, we got tired of eating of our own restaurant food. So we'd have to go out to eat other restaurant food <laughs> to, uh, to satisfy our hunger. So after we, I think the restaurant closed down about 9. And then all, he'd load us all up in the truck. And we'd go off into town about 20 miles, 30 miles away, and we would go to, you know, Sirloin Stockade or whatever steakhouse is there in town. We'd just try different ones, Shoney's, whatever. And we would eat all, you know, we would eat our hearts out. But I remember inevitably on our way home, it's another 30, about 30 minute drive home, sometimes a little bit longer. On our way home, consistently, I would fall asleep. What's interesting to me is that as soon as I get in the car, you know, I just ate, oh, my belly's full. You know, maybe I start reading a book or something, and I, and, I, and I lean over, and I'm out. Then, like, seconds later, I'm awake. We're home. What? What do you mean we're home? We just left. How did I get home so fast? Is it like some kind of time machine? I mean, this is crazy. Death is like sleep. And in sleep, there is no recognition of time, right? I mean, I mean of course... It could probably be better uh, analogy to anesthesia. Anybody here ever ha been under anesthesia before? Okay, several of you guys have. And when you go under anesthesia, they say that it's, it, it's even more real than sleep in the sense that you're out, you're awake. And you guys can confess and testify of that. No dreams. Just seems like immediate. That's the idea of sleep. Time is not, you're not, you're not you know, as you're sleeping in the ground, you're not like day one. Day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. You know, it's, it's not, the time isn't passing like that in death. In death, you're unconscious. So until you wake up, you're going to be like, what? What do you mean it's the second coming already? Praise the Lord. I just, I just fell asleep. It's been like 100 years, but I just fell asleep. You know, it's going to be that kind of experience. Here's what the Bible says in Psalm 13, verse 3. In fact, 53 times it compares death to sleep. It says, Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, the sleep of death. Here we find again in the book of Job 14, verse 12, so a man lies down and rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. See, see, see uh, uh, Job here understood what happened to people when they died. He said they're not going to rise again till when? To the heavens be no more. When does that happen? At the second coming of Jesus. It says that's when they're awoken. When it, remember Jesus? He says they, he wakes them up out of their graves. He says, nor will they be raised out of their sleep. So the dead people are sleeping right now. And by the way, many of the, uh, the um, um, Protestants understood this when they got the Bibles back in their hands. They're reading their Bibles like, what? Because the, 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 the teaching, the standard teaching um, uh, from the Roman Catholic Church was this idea that you went to a place called, anybody know? Purgatory. The teaching of purgatory was this. The only way you can go to heaven is if you're perfect. Well, who dies perfect? Nobody. So you go to a place called purgatory where your sins are purged out of you. And so you're beaten, you're whipped, you're burned, you're scalded, you're, you go through all these tortures until you burn off all your sins and you're finally just or righteous enough to go on into heaven. That's the idea of purgatory. And 
uh, now biblically speaking, there is no purgatory. Um, and biblically speaking, when you die, you don't go to heaven, so there's no need for a purgatory. But biblically speaking, God takes care of our character in this life, not in the next life. Purgatory offers people a second chance. The Bible does not offer a second chance. The book of Hebrews, chapter, um, oh, now I'm going to, I think it's chapter 9, second to last verse, or the last verse there says, it's appointed, appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Was, my friend's taking notes, want that verse. I'm going to give it to him. Book of Hebrews, chapter 9, says, unto them that look for him, he will appear a second time without sin unto salvation. Um, okay, verse 27. So Hebrews 9, 27, and as, is, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will he appear a second time apart for sin for salvation. And so the Bible teaches that at death is it. There's no more opportunities at death. If you, if you die in a, in a condition of being lost, you will be lost for eternity. Okay? So don't think that in, after death you have an opportunity to get your character right. In fact, your character is the only thing you're taking with you to heaven. You need to get your character right right now. If you have sins right now, you need to repent of them right now because after death, there is no repentance. Does that make, is that clear? So anyway, the main teaching, the main doctrine that almost every Christian believed based on the teachings of the church was this idea of purgatory that you live on after death. It was very rare cases of people that would go straight to heaven without going to purgatory. They would call those the saints or whatever. And they often would pray to saints and, and pray to these people who were supposedly dead. This is the idea that the Protestants were confronted with. They said, well, if purgatory is wrong, what happens to people when they die? Well, that's a great question. And Martin Luther, for example, understood this correctly. He said this, um, in a letter to Nicholas Amsdorf, he said, It is probable, in my opinion, that with very few exceptions indeed, the dead sleep in utter insensibility to the day of judgment. They're asleep until God raises them up. Here, uh, he writes in the Christian Hope, Martin Luther says, We shall sleep until he comes and knocks on the little grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up! Then I shall arise in a moment and be happy with him forever. Sleep! in insensibility until he knocks on the door of the grave. You like that idea? Remember the Bible says that he has the key to unlock the grave? Jesus is coming back, friends. And if you die in Christ, you will rise to newness of life. Remember, so when you think about death, think about, but you know what? One of my favorite things to consider when I think about death is a sleep. Sleep, by definition, is something that's temporary. Isn't that right? Sleep is something that happens to people that, 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 um, that pre, uh, pre-assumes a, an awakening, right? If you're going to sleep, you're going to awake. That's the idea of death. Death is temporary. Death is something that is just for a moment. It's unconscious, but there will be an awakening from it. Here are some other verses that you find sleep referred to as death. It says, uh, the Lord said to Moses, you shall sleep with your fathers. David slept with his father. Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Rehoboam slept with his fathers. Joram slept. Jehu slept. You want some more? Here we go. Joash slept. Jehoash slept. Jehoash slept. Jeroboam slept. Azariah slept. Mahanim slept. Jotham slept. Hezekiah slept. You want more? I, don't, I, I, I could put more up, but I'm going to save you guys tonight. The Bible teaches that the dead are asleep. One of my favorite examples in all the Bible of this is Jesus himself comparing death to his sleep. He talks about this man named Lazarus. We can read about it in John 11, verse 11 through 14. Remember, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, sends a messenger to Jesus. Hey, your, your friend Lazarus, he's about to die. But Jesus doesn't go right away. And so Lazarus ends up dying. And then Jesus says to his disciples after a few days, he says, hey, let's go uh, see Lazarus. He's sleeping. He says, Jesus, if Lazarus is sleeping, why are you going to go wake him up? If he's sleeping, he's going to get better, right? Here's what he says. These things said he, after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. You see that? But they thought he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, 
Lazarus is dead. So if Lazarus was dead, yet he was sleeping, then Jesus is using sleep to illustrate what death is like. But he says, I go to wake him up. There, which, that's called a resurrection. So I want you to see now what transpires between Martha and Jesus after he said this. Then said Martha unto Jesus, after he shows up, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. That's probably true. But I know that even now, whatever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus says unto her, notice these words, your brother shall rise again. I want you to imagine those words going through your ears in that moment. Your brother will rise again. Where did she think her brother was? In heaven? You think her, she thought her brother was in hell? Where did she think her brother was? In the grave. Because where would you rise from? You don't rise from heaven. Your brother will rise again. When did she expect to see her brother again? Look at what she said in the very next verse. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. What had Jesus been teaching? What is this doctrine that Jesus has been espousing? The teaching that the dead are dead until the resurrection that they shall rise again at the resurrection last day. That she's repeating to Jesus what he had taught her. Now, what she didn't realize is that Jesus had more um, instant plans than that last day resurrection. He said under, Jesus said, take away the stone. He said, Mar um, but first of all, he said in that, if we kept reading, I just want to say this is John 11. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live again. That's good news. That's the resurrection. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead how long? I mean, this isn't some like, 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 you know, half an hour, maybe he's dead, maybe he's not. This is four days of death. Dead for sure. He's decomposing by now. His body, you know, it wasn't like he was in Egypt with like a mummy. He was decomposing. So he says, as they rolled away the stone, they obeyed him, praise the Lord. He said, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> I don't know what they heard. I don't know what they smelled. But I know what they saw. Here comes this man all wrapped up, bundled up, come a-hopping up out of that cave, right, out of that tomb. And, <laughs> and Jesus is like, why are you guys standing around? Go unwrap that guy. And they go unwrap him, and there's Lazarus. Can you imagine, friends? You know, I can see it. I can just imagine that that day is this happened. Because there's a lot of people witnessing this. You know, they had the whole funeral train that came out, and all the mourners who were paid to mourn and all this stuff. They all came out. So I can see it. As he said, Lazarus, come forth. There's, a, there's ABC, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC. They're all there with their microphones. Lazarus, you've been dead for four days. Really? I just fell asleep. I, well, I can actually say, well, what did you experience in death? You know what his answer was? He doesn't tell us. I mean, I can imagine that if, if he, it, Lazarus would have had an inside story, wouldn't he? It'd be, this would have been front page news about what Lazarus experienced in death. But the reality is, he didn't experience anything. And Jesus didn't call Lazarus down from heaven. Where did he call him from? The tomb, Lazarus come forth, right? Lazarus wasn't up there enjoying heaven and came down and said, Jesus, why did you do that? I was so much, I was starting to enjoy heaven. Four days, it's been great. And why did you bring me here? Gee, he didn't do that. Lazarus was dead. He was unconscious. He was in the grave. Understand this. Death is like a sleep. Satan is going to deceive the world through this false teaching about death. All the world is going to be deceived by the sorceries of Satan. And sorcery specifically has to do with this communication with the dead. And that's what it, the Satan has been preconditioning the world to accept. You guys have probably heard about this lady here. Professes to be a Christian, by the way. Her name, I forget her name, but Long Island Medium is the show that she has. And she, she'll go through these experiences where she's like, you know, I, I perceive right now somebody in the room has um, their, their, their grandmother, um, you, ma'am, you, ma'am, and they start pointing out people, and, and she starts saying things that nobody else knows. 
She says, well, you know, that, 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 that locket that your dad gave you, I know exactly where it's at. He just told me where it's at. It's, it's in the bathroom, in the sink, in the very back of the sink. That's where that locket is. And they say, oh, there's no way anybody could know that. Well, you know who was watching as that locket got put away? Demonic spirits. You know who listens to conversations and who can impersonate the dead? We have an example in the Bible in the Witch of Endor of, of a satanic or demonic being impersonating the prophet Samuel in death. You know, we know that the devil can do that. He can impersonate the look. He can impersonate the voice. He can do all that because the devil comes as, unto us as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a shining angel, right? An angel of light, the Bible says. He's going to deceive us. And so this woman is considered somebody who has a sixth sense, an ability to, to see into um, the, uh, the, uh, the, dark, the other world, right, the other side. And because she can see, then what she says, people believe. Medium, the ghost whisperer. Harry Potter, there's several things in, those, in that, in that uh, book series that talks about communication with the dead or the ghosts. Don't kiss them goodbye. Remember that movie, actually, Ghost? Remember that one became popular? If you don't watch TV, don't worry about going and figuring these things out. But I remember watching Ghost with Whoopi Goldberg, and I don't remember that guy's name. Um, Patrick Swayze, you guys have obviously watched it too. So, you know, and then, and then they, it's the weirdest thing, but you know, this, this, this ghost is wandering around trying to find rest, right? And it, and, it, and it enters into these bodies and possesses people. This is satanic. It is satanic, friends. And while people know that's Hollywood and that's just make-believe, now people believe that there's something taking place. Something is happening behind the scene. Ghost hunters... The dead are alive, and they can and do communicate with you. The sixth sense. I see dead people. Remember that? I wish I never watched that movie. i got to get it out of my head. This book right here, Embraced by the Light, this lady supposedly has this near-death experience. I, I read this book soon after I became a Christian, and I almost got sucked into the spiritualism, the spiritism, this idea that the dead are alive, and they can communicate with you. And that's exactly what this experience that she went through. And you know, I, believe, I almost believe this was true. And it was so beautiful. She said when she died, she went to heaven. She's being shown around. She's meeting all these people, all these loved ones that she knew, her grandma and all these people. And while she's there, she's talking to Jesus. You know what Jesus tells her? All the religions are basically the same. We should just love one another. That's the whole point. Love, love, love. There's no difference. It's just love. And I said, oh, that sounds so good. And then it just, but then just one thing after another, I said, I know the Bible doesn't agree with that. The Bible doesn't agree with that. But, but she's been there. How, how can I say, you know, her, her experience is, 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 is wrong whenever she went through that. And the Bible may say this, but she's been there. And I had to realize, I had to choose. What the Bible says or what somebody's experience says. Who am I going to trust? Who am I going to believe? I had to believe the Bible. Somebody knew that this, this danger would come, and this, uh, this um, old magazine, Signs of the Times, said this in 1894, through, the, through this false doctrine, the way has been opened for the spirits of devils to deceive people in representing themselves as the dead. Satanic agencies personate or impersonate the dead and thus bring souls into captivity. Satan has a religion. He has a synagogue and devout worshipers. I think this quote is right. You know, there's a danger out there that, that people believe the dead can talk to them. And I've personally, and I would say, over the last four years of traveling and doing these seminars, and about half of my meetings, I've always had somebody come to me and say, I, I was talking with somebody who was dead. It was either my mom or my grandma. One lady, she was talking to her dad. Her dad showed her all these. Uh, he saved her, saved her thousands of dollars by showing her the landmarks on the property. Turned out that her dad was a demon that she'd been talking for, with for years, right? She said the, the Virgin Mary and Michael the Archangel would come and visit her, and she'd be communicating with them as well. And she had these, this very strong. But now, you know what she is? She is a faithful Christian, knows that the dead are really dead, and those, those demons do not come and talk to her anymore. Because in the name of Jesus, they will not come by. How much do the dead know, friends? We know what the Bible says. For the living know that they shall die, say it with me, but the dead know not anything. People who believe the dead can communicate with them are falling for this deception of spiritualism. 
Satan is the one who introduced spiritualism. In fact, uh, E.W. Sprague, who was a spiritualist, said this about the Bible. He said, spiritualism says the dead know more than the living. And the serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. In this, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord is in error. That's, the, that's what spiritualism will lead you to, distrusting the Bible, believing what people say, their experiences over the Word of God. Here's what one author wrote about spirit, spiritism. Spiritism and spiritualism is the same thing. The fundamental principle of spiritism is that human beings survive bodily death and that occasionally, under conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who have gone before. Now, I hope you don't believe that. But many Christians have and do. And maybe it's a Christian form of that, but it's still just as dangerous, friends. The first lie that was ever told mankind was in the Garden of Eden on the subject of death. What did the devil say? You're not really going to die. That's the same lie that's being repeated today. The dead aren't really dead. They're, they're just in another form. They've, they've passed on. They're, they're in another uh, 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 sphere of existence. In fact, the dead actually do know more than you. And, the, and they know more than living. They can inform us. They can teach us. They will visit us. They will lead us and guide us. You've heard of the Ouija boards, right? The whole idea behind a Ouija board is this idea of listening to these spirits. Just the other day, a, a friend of mine uh, wrote a little uh, um, note that was cautioning people that her grandson, who she teaches and, 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 and helps instruct, came and was, was communicating with this demon through this game that kids are playing in school. I, I, I don't remember the details of it. I should actually use that for my next presentation about this subject because let me tell you something. This idea that the demons, or that, that, that they're talking to demons... They're really talking to dead people, but they are talking to demons. And the demons are listening. And the demons are sharing. The demons are influencing. And we want that? Absolutely not. We've got to understand what happens to people when they die. And how do we know? The Bible tells us the dead know not anything. And what are these ghosts? What are these, what are these beings out there that are, considering them, that, that, are, that are acting like the dead? The Bible says, for they are spirits of devils working what? miracles. Ghosts are really satanic spirits masquerading as the dead. Now, I understand that for some of you, this is a new teaching, something that is different than you've ever heard before, and I respect that. And I'm not saying believe me for what I, for, because I'm just preaching it up here. I'm saying follow the Bible. But maybe in your minds already, a question has arisen, and I'm going to head off a couple questions that, that come up. One of them is about this, uh, the, 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 you've heard about the thief on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. You've heard that before. We're going to look at that now and, and see what the Bible actually says versus what some people think it says. So here's what the Bible verse says. If you read it from the King James Version, this is exactly what it reads like. This is Luke 23, 42, and 43. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise paradise. So it seems to say on the first reading of this that, hey, thief, you're going to be with me in paradise this day. That's what it seems like it's saying, right? But that's not what it's saying, and I'm going to share with you why. First of all, let's ask the question, where is paradise? Okay? Paradise, we have to find the location of it. According to 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, the apostle Paul was caught up into the third heaven. The first heaven is where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the stars, moon, and sun are. The third heaven is where God dwells. I don't know a lot of details about the dwelling of God in the third heaven, but the Bible here in this verse calls it paradise, the place where God dwells. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7 says that the tree of life is in the midst of the paradise of God. Where's the tree of life? In the midst of the paradise of God. So wherever you find the paradise of God, you find the tree of life. And Revelation 22, 1 through 2 tells us that in the New Jerusalem, you find the tree of life and the river of life. So apparently the new Jerusalem where the throne of God is, that is where the, that's what paradise is. The new Jerusalem in the city where the tree of life is, that's paradise. So now that Jesus, now that we know what paradise is, 
In fact, I think these are the only four references, these three references, and then the fourth one is there uh, where we read, Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. So there's paradise. So when Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise, where is he saying? Where the Father is, where the tree of life is, in the city of God. That's what Jesus promised was, you're going to be with me in the city of God with the Father. Okay? The question is, did he go to the Father in the tree of life that day? Well, well, let's see what it says. It says, uh, John 20, verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. This is the resurrection, after his resurrection. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So on the resurrection morning, Sunday morning, Jesus comes up out of the grave miraculously by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And Jesus says, what? I have not yet been to my Father? If Jesus had not yet been to his Father, which is in paradise, then how can he tell the thief that he's been in paradise that day? Doesn't work, does it? There's got to be something we're missing here. Here's what I want to show you to make this completely clear for you. Luke 23, 43 Here's what it looks like if you're reading it in the Greek. These are, uh, the Greek language did not have commas, parentheses, um, uh, uh, quotation marks, periods. If you wanted to read the Greek, you had to rightly divide it to figure out where one word started and the next word ended. There wasn't spaces between words. You see that? I mean, there, there were certain spaces between sections and various different things, but the words just ran on one to the next to the next to the next. Now, if you understood Greek, it was, you know, it would kind of look like this. If you just read it straight from the Greek, this is that verse in Greek, all right? Now, I can't read Greek that well, but there it is. If we were to take it basically and put it in an English uh, equivalent, there's what, there's what it would look like. Can you imagine reading English like this all the time? I mean, you could, you could do that. I mean, if you're a really good, patient reader, you could break that down, find out where one, because you know the English language pretty well, you'd find out where one word ends, one word begins. And if you did this a lot, you'd probably get really good at it. But thankfully, we know that we can break it up into separate words just like that. My question is this. When did the punctuation come into the English language? When did they start putting commas and parentheses and quotation marks and periods and exclamation points and question marks? When did all that start happening? Not until the year 1490. 1490, friends. The Bible was written centuries before this. And it wasn't until 1490 that we started getting this punctuation. My question is this. When it came time to put the punctuation in, how would they know where to put it? Well, they're scholars, right? They know the Greek language. They know the Hebrew language really well. So they did their very best to put the in the right place. Do you think that the translators of, of the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into English, do you think they were perfect in where they would put the commas and periods? Now, I think very well. I mean, it is accurate. The Bible is completely accurate, okay? But there is a place or two or three where you're going to find a comma either missing or in the wrong place. This is one of the verses that I think happened there. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Without a comma there, you don't know where the emphasis goes. Now, the translators, they put the comma after the word thee, right? Um, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's where the emphasis goes if you put the comma there. But let's say we just take that comma and... Do this little thing there. Whoop, there it goes. Let's just move the comma right over there. Now what's it say? Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Does that make a difference in the meaning of the verse? Of course it does. It doesn't change the Greek language. It doesn't twist the words of Jesus around. It just basically is showing you that the translators of the Bible, as they put punctuation in, they probably in their minds believe that, when, that, they, that the thief saw Jesus that day, so it made sense. And yet you can read several places in the Bible where the commas are in the wrong place and the emphasis, uh, and it changes the emphasis. Okay? But let us not confuse it. Let's let the whole Bible teach the truth about death. And then the verses like this, let's study it to find out how it fits in. Commas make a difference. Like this one here. Let's eat grandma. Versus let's eat grandma. Did you see the difference? Believe me, Grandma would notice the difference. <laughs> How about this one right here? 
Attention, toilet only for disabled elderly pregnant children. <laughs> you think they need some commas in that place? I would say they need some commas. Friends, I think that, that if we're not careful about it, we could be twisting the scriptures the wrong direction. The fact is, we know that the comma would take place after the word today because Jesus is saying, I'm telling you to the thief on the cross. He's saying, I'm telling you today, you're going to be with me in Paris. What did the thief ask? Lord, I want to be with you when your kingdom comes. When was the thief expecting the kingdom to come? Well, I mean, he may not have known all the truth about it, but it's the second coming. It's the resurrection. It's the last day. He wasn't expecting to be with Jesus that day. He was expecting to be with Jesus when his kingdom comes. And now Jesus says, hey, 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 I receive your faith. And I'm telling you today, even though he didn't look like a king, I'm telling you today as a king that you will be with me in paradise. Now, there's a, there, today you're going to leave with a, with a book. This little booklet is called... Um, What's it called, Daniel? Absent from the body and present with the Lord. You've all heard that verse before, right? If you study that passage out from the Bible, and you're going to, please read this book. I don't have time to get into it in depth, but let me just say this. There's only two places that you're going to live, here or in heaven, right? You're either going to have a physical body now, or you're going to have, the Bible talks about this, 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 uh, this tabernacle, right? This temple that we have right now. But we're also going to be clothed with a heavenly body. Right? Paul said, I don't want to be naked. You know what that is? That's death. Because in nakedness, you don't, you're not with Jesus. He says, I want to be clothed with my heavenly body. He says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What that verse doesn't say is to be absent from the body is to be immediately present with the Lord. Because there's really two places to be alive. Here or there. Because in between, you're dead. You're not alive. So that verse, to, be, to say absent from the body to be present with the Lord is exa saying exactly the opposite of what people think it means. It's saying that you're alive here or you're alive there, but you're not alive when you're dead. And that's exactly what people say is that you're alive when you're dead. And that's foolishness. That's unbiblical. Now, somebody's going to ask me about what last day, or excuse me, near-death experiences. There has been an uprise of near-death experiences. People saying that they've, uh, on their deathbed, they've seen this or they've seen that. Many people in my seminars come to me and say, I've had a near-death experience. I've been to heaven. I've been to hell. I've seen these things. And it's become very popular uh, to talk about these near-death experiences. And there's been books written about this. You guys have heard about the book or movie, Heaven is for Real. And there's been, I mean, made millions and millions of dollars off of this. The idea of this little boy, six years old, innocent kid, having a near-death experience, coming back and telling the story about, uh, you know, a baby brother that he didn't, or baby brother or sister that he didn't even know he had because it was a miscarriage. About a grandmother that he never really got to know, but she's in heaven and come to tell these stories. And so this child comes back who, you know Children are, they don't have guile, right? They don't con con contrive these, these, these lies, and yet this, so this child comes back and tells a story. Everybody believes it. He was really in heaven, and he really tells us what it's like. The problem is when you read the story, a lot of things he tells you contradicts what the Bible says. Who are you going to believe? A kid that doesn't look like he's lying or the Bible that never lies? Here's another kid. He was six years old whenever he suffered a horrific accident, and uh, his name is Alex Malarkey. I'm not making that up. That's his real name. The boy who came back from heaven, selling all kinds of books and materials about his experience until Alex Malarkey, who came back and told this crazy story, he began to grow up. He began to read the Bible for himself. And you know what he said? Listen to what this young boy said. He's a teenager now. He says, I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. When I made the claims I did, I had never read the Bible, said Malarkey. People have profited from lies. And continue to. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Praise God, he woke up and realized the truth about this and that he was deceiving people. They immediately went into all the Christian bookstores and took these books off the shelf. Why didn't they take the other ones off the shelf, even though they were telling the same lies? Here's another one, Miracles from Heaven, about this girl that fell, falls into a tree and comes and begins to tell stories about heaven that she experienced. People believe these things. And there's one actual book out there. Um, actually, I'll talk about that on Friday. I'm going to tell you about that book on Friday. I'm going to hold off on that. So quick question. Are near-death experiences real? Yes, the experiences are real, but what they've experienced is not. <laughs> when somebody dies, right, first of all, if they come back to life, they never really died. I know some people say, I've died three times. 
you look like you've never died any because you're alive. If you've died, you're not alive, okay? Sure, you maybe medically died, you know, your brain stopped working, your heart stopped pumping for a short time, but you're alive. So you never really died. So that's why they call it near-death experiences. So there's people that says, I was, I was dead. While I was dead, I had these visions. I, I went to heaven. I was with Jesus. I saw this. I saw the angels. I was going to the light. But what is really taking place? Are they really experiencing these things? Here's what's happening. There's activity in the brain taking place. What is happening? The brain during this time is being deprived of oxygen. Virtually in every case of a near-death experience, the brain has no oxygen or little oxygen. The brain begins to hallucinate. When you have a dream at night, do you believe you wake up in the morning and say, hey, I really saw a 30-foot tall dog. Does anybody really tell you that believe that their dreams are real? And yet this near-death experience is very much the same way as the dreams work. It's just happening at a very crucial moment where your life is being drained out of you. And so your brain is working on this, uh, you know, this, this, this way in which you're hallucinating and seeing these crazy things. I've done drugs and hallucinated, okay? But I had the wisdom to know that they weren't real experiences. Not, during, not while I was having them. I thought they were real. But afterward, I realized, yeah, it wasn't real. And so when somebody has a near-death experience, it's nothing more than a dream. And to take it literal or to base your beliefs off of it is extremely dangerous, friends. The Bible says the dead know not anything. One day soon there's going to be a resurrection. And I hope you're in it. Well, I hope you're alive before the, you know, the... I don't, I, I don't want to die. I want to be one of the very few people who never die. How about that? One day soon, friends, there's going to be a time when those graves open up and the dead who are in Christ are going to come up out of those graves, then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to go through those golden, or those, down the golden streets through those pearly gates. You want to be there? The only way anybody's going to beat me through those pearly gates, they're going to have to run faster than me. Because every saint, every righteous person, with very few exceptions, I'll, I can talk about the Bible exceptions at another time, but with very few exceptions, everybody's going through those gates at the same time. Because the dead in Christ are going to rise, and we which are alive and remain should be caught up together. But friends, don't miss out. You know, don't be deceived. Don't be tricked by the lies of Satan and accept the last day sorceries of, of Satan and believing satanic and demonic beings that they're really alive that they the, represent the dead. Don't believe that. But friends, more importantly, don't miss out on that resurrection. Whether you're alive or whether you're dead in Christ, you want to make it during that first resurrection. Amen? Not to put it off for one more minute. This is a very important topic. Let me ask you this tonight. This is my question. How many of you are personally planning on being in that resurrection of the just. Come on, let me see those hands. Praise the Lord. Not a hand down in the house. God is good, friends. I want you to be there all the time. God is good. Let us pray. Father, we all, every one of us, want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Help us, Father to examine our lives and to be those Christian, godly Christian people, the just and faithful Christians you want us to be. Help us, Father, to get to know our Bible so we can discern truth from error, lies from your truth. God, lead us closer to Jesus. Lead us closer to the truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, friends. Um, we got some refreshments over in the other hall. And uh, remember, tomorrow night, five, or excuse me, 6.30, Revelation's abyss of desolation. We'll see you guys uh, over there.